Pam Green leverages her library and information science background to bring people and content together. In her 15 years at Microsoft, she has managed Microsoft Library, uh, the, the, like, the Microsoft Library inter internet site, including its migration to SharePoint. God bless you for that. She has been responsible for the corporate taxonomy service and most recently worked on content management and delivery in Microsoft IT. Please welcome Pam Green. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, it's so great to be here. I feel really bad for interrupting all those great conversations in the spirit of InfoCamp. That's probably where the best stuff is going down. So um, I really was um, humbled to be asked to come here. So I come before you as basically a practitioner right now just to share some of what I um, do in my day to day. And yes, it's been at Microsoft for 15 years. So, um, but I do have to add that I think the, um, the next version of the polar bear is like mutant polar bear with superhuman strength and like laser beam ice eyes. I think that's where the polar bear is going. I just want to let you know that. <laughs> Mike back there. So um, really um, what I have to bring, like I said, is from a practitioner point of view. So um, I did go to the iSchool. I have an MLIS. Um, the IMSM program hadn't actually even been invented yet when I went to school there. So I kind of cobbled together my own. And I actually took classes from the, um, from the what wasn't actually an HTC, HCD program yet at the time. So um, you can hack your own thing if it doesn't work out for you. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. I'm sure everyone will use your program. <laughs> so the enterprise, big companies. How many people here have or do now work for a big company, big enterprise? I know the Boeing person back there. Wow, pretty significant. How many have or do work with at for in some way touch Microsoft? A few. OK. I was at an IA meetup a few years ago, and the conversation came around to where I happened to be from. And um, someone mentioned, well, you know, all roads kind of lead to or from Microsoft eventually. And that may be true. Too. It's a big presence. But um, it's been pretty good to me. It's not bad gig for a librarian, is what I often say to people. But I've learned over the years a few things to, um, to try to get things done. Because Microsoft is a big company. There's a lot of big enterprises out there. They're, they're enormous. There's a lot of different things going on. They're complex. And they're always changing. So at Microsoft, we know about the products we have, the Xbox, Surface, Windows, Office, the Dynamics content for, for sales communities, um, all those different services and products. Then, and then there's all of the infrastructure happening underneath it. Those of us in the company working, there's four different um, data centers on four different continents, 120 different subsidiaries. We've got all the processes and the tools. Um, we've, we've had been retiring over many years to try to simplify, but there's been thousands of internal tools cataloged at some point or another serving HR, finance, product development, all that stuff. And so how do we get any attention on IA? Whenever I'm going through my daily job and I know that it is a need that's out there for big corporations, how do I bring the conversation back to IA? So I have found the key for me tends to come back to this, pain, fear, and greed. The three big motivators. Now, I want to step in here again and say I'm a, coming at this as a pragmatist. So as much as I love to discuss information theory, high-level content strategies, all the fun things that, that I loved about the iSchool, at the end of the day, I've got to get stuff done. And I've got to get it done regardless of what I think all the priorities are and in budget, and hopefully on time. So that's where I'm coming from. So when I heard this quote a few years ago, that there's three things that mainly motivate people, pain, fear, and greed, I thought, oh, that's pretty pessimistic. I didn't, I didn't like it at first. But I found myself coming back to it again and again as I worked on projects and finding that what, the way I was connecting with people to really understand their needs was that they had a pain around something, they were afraid of something happening, or they had some sort of greed, which if you feel better, you can say desire or want. You know? There's no value judgment here. This is just the reality of human nature. And so what I learned is being able to tie into that hook as with the pain, fear, and greed with my stakeholders and customers 
and then turn to look at the solution that I had to offer there, which is hopefully and usually an information architecture solution for hitting the right pains and fears. And even then maybe take it a step further and do some educating and inspiring to move that a little bit further. But once I could hook into what it was that was bringing, was bringing them to our team or to me, I was able to get more of that investment and have them stick with it. Because people are more likely to stick with what's going to reduce their fear, deal with that fear, than they are with just necessarily a big aspirational dream that can be put on the back burner. So give people the label they're searching for to describe the pain and anxiety being faced. This is um, something Abby Covert, a well-known information architect and author, wrote just earlier this month. And thank you to John Coleman. I think I saw you out there earlier for um, tweeting this. I, um, I saw that article and I read it and I highly recommend it. And she does a great job of making the argument that there is more of a need than ever for the clarity and the structure and the awareness of how people look for and use information that we bring to the table. But it's going through a resurgence, right? We always have to recreate ourselves. And so in making her argument, she talks about the pain that cannot be named, the pain with no name. And that's really what I'm talking about here. People come and they've got, they've got problems, and I help define those through these three different buckets often. And then we can move in to the solution. So I'll give a couple different examples. Basically, these are projects I've worked on over the last few years that demonstrate how this pain, fear, greed thing comes into play and how it worked into the kind of solutions that um, we came to. So a team that I worked on before the one I'm on now, we uh, called DISCO, Discovery and Collaboration. It's a team in IT that focuses on um, the managing the corporate intranet space, all the different sites that are created on the internet. If you've been around Microsoft, you know there's a lot. Um, and in our case, it's all in SharePoint. So our team worked on governing SharePoint. And um, we spent a lot of time working with getting folks off our on-premises SharePoint space into the cloud. Everyone's all into the cloud was the big, um, big focus for, uh, for a while. And we're still working on it. But in the thick of this, we would talk to LCA, HR, legal or legal is LCA finance, corp comms, about getting their content off their on-premise services, sometimes whole farms that they had been working on, and into the cloud space, which is a lot flatter, which isn't as deep as having your whole set of servers of your own. And we tried to use that opportunity to um, introduce them to some better IA practices because of the nature of the way the environment is structured. So one of these clients of ours, because we ended up doing a lot of consulting, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of teams at Microsoft, even HR and legal and finance, have their technologists who are going to do it themselves, too. <laughs> so we did a lot of consulting with a lot of smart people who had ideas on their own also of how to do it. And one of these teams was their services team. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the group at Microsoft, the services group that does consulting and premier support usually for big companies that are, want some extra help with consulting with getting their stuff deployed and run. <clears throat> they have a lot of knowledge sharing that they have to do, a lot of IP, because they're all working with different customers all over the world, Credit Suisse or Nike or uh, Procter & Gamble or what have you, different, different companies, and they need to share that. And they had a really robust solution on premises in their servers, and they had um, a lot of stuff built out. But they needed to go to the cloud, and they needed to come to our team, and I knew they were hesitant to give up some of that autonomy that um, they had on premises to come to the cloud, where they have, would need to use shared services. And that was another part of what our team provided to the organization, was managing these, these shared services and offering them. Specifically, I worked on the taxonomy, the corporate taxonomy, and the content types, or the shared schemas that the content could use across the internet. And then my colleague was the search PM, worked with getting folks onboarded into the enterprise level search. So in, in talking to our customers in the services group, we knew they had hesitancy about losing that autonomy. But I was able to also understand and identify some other um, pain there that we could help with and, and help them see the value of our services. One was the pain of the time and effort to manage their own metadata. So they were building their own taxonomies. They had a whole product taxonomy that they were building. And we were already building one. 
in our space. It takes a lot of time to build a product taxonomy for Microsoft. There's a lot of products, and they're, they're always changing. We also work with HR to find, to find the roles, if we're going to do role targeting and tagging of content to align with the, the roles that people are identified with. We also work with finance to understand the regions as they're defined by our business space. Put all those in our taxonomy. Um, and they would have to do all that on their own. They, if they're defining these and managing their own taxonomy, they have to figure that all out for themselves. The other was their fear of being left out of the central search being not part of what I um, found myself referring to as the information ecosystem of the intranet. In the O365 and SharePoint online space, that's a big space. There's a lot of stuff there. And we, then you start getting into the office graph, which is a whole other conversation. But all of that, all of the, that information and the connections between that information. And if the content is being built in a silo, Instead, as we pointed out earlier, corporations and businesses tend to end up working in silos, then that information won't be part of that ecosystem. It won't be part of that central search where employees go first to find often what they're looking for. So the solutions we moved to for the pain was to reuse the corporate metadata. I could assure them that they're going to alleviate that pain of having to track down the new products and assure that there's a definition for that, for that term, the taxonomic appropriateness, as I like to throw out to my um, customers, that the term is defined properly. We had a whole set of taxonomists working on this and making sure it's a high quality um, taxonomy. And there's value in that. And so that was how I turned that pain into seeing what our IA solution could be for them. And then in the area and the fear of not being included was to work with my um, colleague, the search PM, and to make sure that their content types that they have are aligned with our central content types and the, the different schemas that are, can be shared across the enterprise and that are then mapped into how the search displays and what's being queried on and how all of those different rules are working. So we work with them on that. And we're able to bring them in and onboard them and um, get them in the cloud. Currently, I work on a team called IT Showcase. And we are the team that basically tells the story of how Microsoft does IT. So if someone says, how did Microsoft deploy Windows 10? Or how do you manage all those internet sites? Our team is the team that creates the content for that. The case studies, the white papers, the videos about how um, we're doing that stuff. Because people want to know. And we want to be transparent about it. So um, we have basically two audiences for this content. One is our field sellers, people in the field whose customers come to them and say, hey, before we spend all this money with you on this technology, how are you really doing it? Like, where's the, you know, what's your real story? And then we, they can turn to us, and we will give them the information. And the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, oftentimes. You know, what we're learning, because we, we learn a lot along the way. Um, and we like to try to be able to share that. But we also have customers outside of that we directly speak to. Anyone who wants to come to the website on Microsoft.com could be an IT pro, could be a student, it could be a business decision maker who want to come and find the content on their own. And so when I joined the team, the team had a really um, great solution for developing content. They knew how to find the SMEs in IT. They had a content development process, could get that white paper written and produced. But then it was a little trickier getting it efficiently published and found. Um, and they knew that there was some pain around that. So they, they saw the pain. But what I was able to do was help them fine tune and hone that and name the pain, essentially. So the pain that we named that helped us move into the next phase of solving the problem was the pain around the time and the effort to map the metadata. And as fun as this exercise could be for those of us who just enjoy it, it's not very efficient publishing to have one set of metadata in your content management system that then has to be mapped and transferred to your public publishing location or channel, and then mapped in a different way to your internal publishing channel. And that's what was happening, is terms were applied that were meaningful to the team for their content. And then it had to be translated in these two different places. And you can imagine, not so efficient, that's painful. We also saw that we couldn't really get an accurate view of our content set. Because that, those tags and that metadata was applied a little inconsistently, 
um, <clears throat> it's hard to give a report out of how much are we actually covering? What do we have on this particular product area? Or how much do we actually have in this area of app migration that we keep getting asked a lot about? Is that a gap for us? I'm trying to try to see that set. There's also a fear of bad user experience, um, which can be a common fear. And uh, I have to be honest, in this case, it kind of was proved out to not be such a, it was a reality, that we had this beautiful site, wonderful UX design that had been done, but nothing had been really focused on with search. So we would present, be at conferences with a booth. Customers would walk up, and they'd go right to find the search, run their query, and they couldn't find anything that they were looking for. Just was not working out. Pretty bad experience there. So we knew that was a big pain that we needed to deal with. And finally, the greed here um, is really what I refer to as more efficient pubs. And that's the greed that I want more. This is my own greed. I want more of my, the publishing budget so I can use on other things, right? I mean, I've got a limited resources, even at Microsoft. And so I've got to try to make the most of that. And if I can create efficiencies, I can use that time and those resources someplace else. So <clears throat> we have a conversation about this. And, and this is something that I don't have a word for on the slide, but is actually really, really important to this whole process. And that is, in this conversation, we start clarifying who the audience is for all of this. Why do these pains and fears matter to whom? What do they need to do? What do they care about our content for at all? What does success look like to us? And how do we want to measure that? And as talking about those things, then we start to be able to really get crisp on the solutions for these problems. And those are really important things in every conversation that I would have with, even with my internal customers. And I know, I'm sure those of folks who consult out here, you start a lot of your engagements with working up to trying to get that out of your client, right? And helping define that. We do that internally too. And so when we work through the solutions, the first solution for the pain of time and effort was to create a single taxonomy, which, base, which looks very closely at what, um, what uh, the users um, are trying to understand about our content, how they're looking for it, and how we can bring the internal and external in alignment, which really in our space isn't too far um, off because the salespeople are ultimately working with the end customers. They're sort of an intermediary. But they don't always look at things the same way. So we came up with three um, term sets or taxonomies to work with and started applying those consistently across all of our different channels. The solution for accurate view of what's there was take those taxonomies and apply them to the content, <laughs> which means training the folks putting the metadata in on <coughs> excuse me, what these terms mean, the scope, um, when, when they should apply them, and also investing a little bit and, and for someone to come in, who, a library science person actually, who came in and looked at our content and, and caught us all up on tagging because we were out of, um, we, we were behind the ball there and needed to bring it forward. For the, uh, the bad user experience, I worked with our site PM to get that metadata, that quality metadata after we got it applied, into our website. And it just deployed, actually, um, a few weeks ago. And so rather than going in and, and hunting for the search and then putting in a term and maybe it would match, it was being auto-tagged for a while, actually. So the, the system would scan and see if there's any reference to a product name in the whole piece and then tag the content with it. And we know how that goes if there's some the tertiary reference in the last paragraph, and it looks like it's all about um, Xbox when it was just some reference to the Xbox team and, and, and some internal tool. So we bring this quality metadata up. It can be searched across, bringing us better precision. And then also, if someone does a really broad search, we expose it now as filters, and people can narrow down. Seems like 101, but it really has improved the, the um, experience there. And it wasn't inherently obvious to everyone working on and building the site. It was the information architecture perspective that came in that, was help, that helped us think through that and get us to that point. And finally, the more efficient publications, um, getting back to the relieving the first pain, it, publication became much quicker by not having to map all these different tags across all these different places. So we were able to focus and save some money in that way too and use that team more efficiently. So <laughs> these are just a couple examples of projects. Um, and this, it's actually a theme I've seen, though, again and again, of starting the conversation with folks and seeing that there's actually a pain to be named here or some sort of, some sort of fear or worry. And there's, there are some common themes that have come out around that in the IA space. In the pain space, 
We've got the too much time or effort situation, which happens a lot. They're creating their own term sets. They're, create, they're recreating schemas that have already been created by someone else in the organization. And this is actually, as a side note, a benefit of being <clears throat> around a big company for a long time is that I've got to come to know people who are running some of the, like the metadata services in another part of IT. And they work with these tools. And they're defining something very similarly. And over here, a couple years ago, I worked with a team that's doing this. I'm going to reach out and see if they're still working on that, because these could be a great point of integration. And we can start creating some efficiencies there. Poor discoverability, big, big pain that IA is often the, oh, the superhero that can come in and save the day on that one. Not being included in the ecosystem. This becomes more and more imperative as we're looking at the big kind of graphs of content. And you need the content needs to be part of that ecosystem and aligned with it to be discoverable and have all the Uber algorithms that are going to save all of our information discovery woes find it, right? And more resources. The desire for more resources the desire for more viewers. And I didn't touch on that in either one of these projects, but that is a big driver for um, IA solutions and making that match there with, with IA is a desire or a need for just more users, especially in an internal space. We're not converting with our content to make money for um, what we're doing. Even with IT Showcase, the content that we put out there, no one's paying for, um, for what we do, but we want more viewers because it amplifies the value. So after we make the IA connection, what do I see that is the match, some of the specific um, solutions that tend to come up with these common pains? One is structure based on the goals. So once we understand what those goals are in that conversation, who are the users, what do they need, what are they trying to do with your content, we can start structuring the content to meet those goals. Manage the metadata, and this is something that Mike alluded to is with the whole focus in the IA program of having high quality managed metadata really uh, makes a difference and does matter. And then aligning the structure, having the structure based on the goals and then aligned. In our case, when you're, we're dealing with an enterprise, we have some pretty clearly defined systems out there. We're not um, dealing with uh, a whole world of possibilities, so we can do that. And finally, educate and inspire. Um, this comes after you've, you know, I've, I've met with them. We've talked about it, that I understand what the pain is or that, what that fear is or what their, their wants are. And then we can build on that with a vision. It could be the vision that once that metadata is applied to your structures in place, that content can be more easily targeted to the different channels where we want to send our IT showcase content out there. We can send it just for a particular audience or just on a particular product, say, for, for the Windows Pro magazine. We can um, create content on the fly and be able to have more dynamic pages and scale rather than building handcrafted pages, have pages that just query and bring back content based on as it gets loaded and tagged into the system. And that starts getting people excited. They start to understand more, and then they continue to want to come back and invest in IA. And I'll, I have to say, not every project, of course, goes off swimmingly. Not everyone is, um, just steps into be, being on board with the IA. But I really have seen over the years people come back who've had a deeper understanding, who've gotten a little bit of inspiration, and come back around to me or, or one of the, the teams that work in this space and say, hey, I know we've got a problem here, um, and I think you guys could be the solution. And so that is really the ultimate goal. All right. A minute for a question. Or any, any questions? Just a couple of minutes for those. No, no. Uh, uh, yeah, the question was. Yeah, yeah, how long those projects can take. No. The cloud migration um, project for that particular um, set of sites took, started about in August. It was when my engagement started with them. And we completed sometimes toward the end of the fiscal year. It took almost a whole fiscal year. May, June de delivery time frame. Part of that included a whole entire change right in the middle of the project of all or everyone working on the project on the other team. They totally switched out their KM manager. So we had to re-educate and understand and move forward with that. So yeah. And um, building out the taxonomy and um, 
with the IT showcase, the work took I'm gonna probably say about six months. It could have been done a little bit tighter because there's other things I'm working on too, which is another part of what happens when you're embedded in the enterprise. You put on whatever hat is the biggest priority at, at that time, but yeah, several months. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Pam.